We are coming to the next keynote session by, by an entrepreneur I'm a big, I'm big fan of, uh, Rahul Divan, and I especially thank him to accept our request to come at such short notice because our another uh, keynote speaker had some personal urgency and he could not come. So uh, let's give him a big round of applause, Mr. Rahul Divan, who has come at short notice. Uh, brief about him, Raul Divan is an entrepreneur, open source and agile evangelist, blogger, green activist, and yoga and meditation practitioner. He is the founder of Srijan Technologies, a mid-sized consulting company with expertise in building and modernizing digital systems. To do this, Srijan leverages its expertise in enterprise content management and machine learning. So let's welcome him with a big round of applause on the stage to present his keynote session on the topic, the ingredients for success in life and work. Okay, thank you. Right, it shows up. This is the second time in three years I've been called into be a backup for somebody who could not make it. <laughs> so uh, I hope you still, uh, I leave you all with something valuable by the end of this hour. So actually, if you look at the website, you know, when I was called yesterday, uh, you know, in driving in the car, I thought of a topic and blurted it out. But uh, as I started working at about 10.30 last night to make my presentation, which went on till 2.30 a.m. and then 8.30 in the morning again to complete this, uh, I changed it a little bit. So I'm actually calling the, it the ingredients of success uh, in life and work. And like at many such agile conferences, which I've been speaking at or being part of panels at since about 2013 or so, um, I always try and connect it with my journey. And um, I, let's see if you enjoy what you get to see. A little bit about Srijan. So in 2019, we participated in the Great Places to Work survey. And can you all hear me all right? The back? Yeah? OK. And louder? OK. Uh, so we participated in the Great Places to Work survey in 2019. We do this, we've done this now about three years in the last five or six years. And every time we've made it to the GPTW list. So I just wanted to show you some scores to establish some, uh, you know, share some things and I'll come to the point. So we've been against IT services, about, I think about four or five hundred companies every year participate from India. And so Srijan has been doing fairly well on an overriding score and a trust index score. As compared to, say, IT services, we are not in the top 50, but you know, do a fairly well from a points perspective. If you look at uh, the breakdown of the trust index, you know, there are things like pride, camaraderie, respect, fairness, and credibility. We end up doing fairly well against the IT services uh, companies who participate in the survey. Um, I had data for two years, 2017 and 19, and we've continuously improved from wherever we were, right? So our scores at 73 went up to 79, while the IT services moved from 72 to 74. And, you know, the top 50, they didn't have it for 2017, but they were at 83. So the, while we have a difference, the ma difference was marginal. <clears throat> I'm telling you all this for a reason. I'm not trying to sell Srijan here. So with that disclaimer. We were pretty small. It was founded in 2002. As a, I was sort of just two and a half, three years out of college when I started as a young boy and didn't know, hadn't worked with large companies. So basically just struggled along in building the company. So between 2013 at about 8.5, 8.7 crores, we went up to about 30 crores. And then, you know, in 2017, when Probably our revenues were at, say, about 40 crores, I'm guessing approximately 35, 40 crores. We put up an audacious goal that by 2020, we'll be a 100 crore company. So I learned all of this from people, coaches who came along um, to play 
you know, darts on the board and just put up audacious goals like uh, that book uh, uh, Built to Last says big, hairy, audacious goals. And we set goals like we'll be in certain geographies and so on and so forth. Um, some sort of highlights about us. Um, we are very strong in our agile delivery practices. We have a very large uh, customer retention. So every year we have about 80, 85% customers which continue with us from last one or multiple years. There are about 400 people now. And we did cross, we will cross a 100 cross mark this year. We are a very high EBITDA company. Um, not usual for Indian companies um, outsourcing. We did manage to be in some of the geographies that we set out in 2017 and earlier. And even the income tax department in the local Delhi NCR region actually gave us some credit about you know, how much tax we file and so on and so forth. So the reason for sharing all of this is not to beat my own drums, but uh, to actually sort of just lay the background of, you know, by sort of different standards, from a culture standard, which is the GPTW, or from a financial performance standard, we are a fairly successful company. We're still small, about 400 people, 100 crores, mid-sized, I would say, but doing fairly well. And um, on various criteria, you would probably call us fairly successful. But did our agile processes and our culture, did that lead to a success? Um, it's a little quote. We like to think that success comes from predicting trends, from analyzing data, from gaming our strategies, some sort of logical thinking constantly, logical approach. But is that really so? We've been taught. Uh, a paradigm of have and be. So if you have great clothes, if you have great shoes, you know, you will run well. So right, that's, that's what all the shoe marketing companies tell you. You have great shoes and you will run well. Right? Just, just, what, what is that? Just do something. Just do it, my, Nike. And that's, that's the world of marketing. If you have, you will be. If you have great strategies, great agile practices, hard work, smarts, great team, culture, all of that, you will be successful. But let's actually really uh, examine this. So there's a wonderful article in HBR, and you can look that up. It's called the When Success is Born Out of Serendipity. And it actually says our mind abhors these serendipitous explanations. They're actually talking about how Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, all of them became big companies and so on and so forth. For instance, this article talks about the fact that Google was about to sell off to Yahoo for $1 million, that Microsoft was about to shut down everything except a, a dinner meeting, a serendipitous dinner meeting happened, and that turned things around for them. You must read this article. It's a very nice article. So it says that we like to think that success comes from predicting trends, like I said. <clears throat> but if it was that simple, uh, we should have solved all of this a long time ago, right? All of these strategies are pretty done and beaten down, right? So they're all available. All, all forms of logical thinking is already available in management books, in management gurus, and all of that. So, this article actually takes a stand that it's serendipity which sets us apart from success versus failure. And very few CEOs, entrepreneurs like to give credit to things which are out, outside of their control. Yeah? So they don't like to talk about luck, for example. But we'll examine luck a little bit as well. This article actually takes the position that uh, entrepreneurs and business people, managers need to be open to serendipity in your organization. It actually recommends that you take steps for it. For instance, bring together people from different parts of your organization, bring different, different departments together. I have an opinion on this. Um, this is where I disagree with this article as well. So let's examine what serendipity really means. It actually um, found this definition, luck of fate that takes the form of finding valuable or pleasant things that are not looked for. So this is not a strategy or a goal. I'm not against strategies and goals. I'm all for it. I do that every day. But there is an, this, 
there is an openness to serendipitous events. There is an openness that things can be outside of my control, which will happen. And so there is, with that openness, you're almost, um, you know, you're, you're, present to, you're present to that. And so when they happen, you're, you can take a leap. So what does, so this is this book called Heart Smarts, Guts and Luck. Once again, I believe a Singaporean, but also uh, teaches at Harvard. A very nice book, must, must get book. And it says, lucky people have an openness, an authenticity, a generosity towards embracing people without overthinking what's the value exchange. Basically, this is talking about not making your relationships transactional. Okay, everything cannot be a what's in it for me conversation. It can be an openness, a, a you know, a, a, a being of generosity, just just being, just being giving. Um, you know, in a conversation with an employee, in a, with a customer, uh, we've had a case, for example. So we tend to uh, not have a value exchange conversation with our customers, uh, you know, before, it's not like we would ask for money before we start adding value to a customer, okay? And that gets appreciated. I'll come to that uh, screen a little bit and explain that uh, a little bit better. But we've won projects, large projects with large customers competing against tens of Indian companies at much higher prices and all of that. And customers have told us that you were the only guys who were firstly willing to invest all that time without asking for a check on the table. Okay? So, and, and that's not a strategy for us. It is just a way of being. It is, you know, you find out more before you say, here is what it's going to cost to, for me to serve you. Right? So that's the approach. Let's examine the word have here. It says lucky people have an openness. Now if you go back to the being and having paradigm, it's actually, the word is have, but it's actually a state of being. Isn't it so? Yeah, it's like you're being open, you're being authentic, you're being generous, and that is leading to something. So, you know, I want to reverse the, um, uh, having and being paradigm. So having something for being successful. Let's reverse that. And actually you operate from the position of being, of having some values. Yeah? So when I say English is a difficult language, right? You have to use words like having, but it's actually signifying a state of being. So you have values. And if you operate from those values, you act according to those values. And that leads to a state of having. So it's actually a reversal of what marketing companies tell you. When I started Srijan in 2002, we had this nice logo. At least I find it nice and still attached to it. We're changing it this now completely. At the beginning of the presentation, you may have seen that. But I had these ideas of freedom, self-expression, integrity, and growth in mind. Of course, there was a very serious Indic connect with Dharma, with Shiva, if you've seen the Naga Sadhus and all of that, right? And the colors were extremely Indic. So I thought to myself, can I look at it for 20 years? And I thought, yes. So then that's how I selected it. Um, there were some, a lot of people, mentors, coaches, who just bumped in. And this was referred, uh, for example, by a person called Sen Gupta, these three books, which were transformative for me, all three of them. What did I learn from them? New ideas came in. Transparency, for example, from Maverick. He's an entrepreneur, a Brazilian entrepreneur. You should look him up uh, and read this book. He runs his company with open salaries. And he runs a factory in Brazil with open salary. Okay, so everybody on the shop floor knows their manager's salaries and so on and so forth. I think I'd come across this book in 2004 or 5, somewhere around that. And I thought it was very radical. And for two, three, four years, we actually had an open salaries culture at Srijan. It was very hard. Everybody knew my salary. <laughs> <laughs> and so I did all of these experiments that time. And uh, then for a few years, we, we sort of stopped. And uh, last three years, 
across the delivery organization, pretty much all our salaries are transparent. We are not now going about sharing salaries on Excel sheets like I did in 2005-7. But we have you know, salary bands, and they're not like bands, but they're actually specific salaries. So if, if a person is a senior developer, an X level, L1, L2, whatever, however we have classified it, the person knows everybody who's at this level has the same salary. So there is no ambiguity about it, right? So maybe a bit of socialism, I don't know, whatever you may want to call it, or transparency, but that, that's how it is. So some of these ideas have remained. What else did I learn? That responsibility of our um, self-growth is just completely on us. And actually, the idea of responsibility itself. Yeah, I'm, I would highly recommend reading the other two books, Conversations with God and The Road Less Traveled, especially. It's a very hard book to read. It starts with the words, life is difficult, you know. So you can, life can come crashing down on you. <laughs> but it's a beautiful book of, of an inner journey, if you like. Uh, from one of America's leading psychiatrists, um, Scott M. Peck. Um, these books also taught me about serendipity and the we do have paradigm of thinking. Um, as things evolved, um, our values she kept spreading and what we weren't doing them was articulating these values. They were there. And so I think in 2015, maybe a little earlier, I guess, but that's the year I could remember from my old presentations as I was digging them out from at, uh, last night. And I found these written somewhere in one of the decks. Authenticity, which is walk the talk, responsibility, respect, sharing, equal opportunity. So I'm against the word equality. Nobody can be equal. No one here is equal to the other. But can we have equal opportunity in our enterprises, in our businesses, and so on and so forth, or in our, in our countries, for example. Learning, which is continuous improvement. And somebody, uh, while we were doing these, somebody on my team had said, oh, we don't have enough of excell excellence or pursuit of excellence. And we are low on this metric. So I, I mean, we'd captured that in that deck that time. That's where I pulled it out from. Now coming to think of it, excellence is nothing but continuous improvement. From wherever you are, you just make, a prog make progress from that. Whether it is in our health, it is in our lives, it's in our business, it's in our relationships, anything. Wherever you are, and if you choose to make uh, improvement, for example, you may not want to make improvements in a certain relationship, that's fine. But if you choose to, then that is about learning and it's about continuous improvement. I also pulled out, I make these strategy maps. I learned this from uh, uh, another HBR article and by uh, a leading management guru called Michael Porter. And I saw a strategy map that he had made for uh, Southwest Airlines. So inspired by that, I tried to make something in our, uh, for ourselves as well. So I want to talk about uh, you know, some key items like empowered teams, for example. So profitability, transparency, independent decision making, encourage dissent and self-expression. Let's come to the other part, which is constant training, focus on continuous improvement, leadership training workshops. So everybody, for all leadership people as well. So it's not that somebody else needs training, but I don't. And I'll talk about that in a bit as well. Focus on project outcomes or customer outcomes, right? Keep that at the center of everything that we operate in. And all of our sales, everything is very consultative. There is no transactional selling. I think I should have it somewhere. Uh, it, it is bound to be somewhere, non-transactional selling. Um, in 2017, you know, almost sometimes independently, I come up and make these decks for our internal uh, once in a year or twice in a year off-sites and strategy off-sites or whatever. And I was looking at another deck and which said that how will we win against competitors as five questions of strategy. And I had written down authenticity in every relationship and transaction. High service but not servitude, which means we'll bend backwards for our customers but we'll not be doormats to them. Yeah. And then point number six is continuous learning, investments to adapt, in our skills, services to our customers' business, and taking good care of our people. I was making this absolutely independently on a flight to US uh, 
three weeks back or something. And uh, you, know, you will probably end up finding some similarities. So long-term revenue predictability, which will happen by non-transactional selling. Um, focus on customer outcomes will happen when you have strong discovery processes for which you require consultative selling, for which you require non-transactional selling. You don't ask for money on the table before you walk into a room for a workshop, a half-day or a two-day workshop with a customer to understand what they want to solve. You have to constantly uh, pursue excellence in engineering and constantly keep improving your processes. Um, you know, whatever, uh, high offshore rates, so high profitability, a focus on high profitability for doing all these things has been absolutely essential to us. Very often Indian companies try and keep reducing themselves to lower cost. That has to break. I'm sure it is already breaking away. Uh, we are breaking from that paradigm, but more and more we cannot remain in that paradigm. So you may find similarities here, especially the yellow highlights. I actually took that from our values and this is a little condensed form of, the, of pretty much the same ideas. Right? They, they keep emerging over and over again. I have a coach called Ram Gopalan. Um, he's uh, India's leading Marshall Goldsmith uh, stakeholder-centered uh, coach, um, award-winning coach and all. He coaches CEOs of some very large companies and some very large IT services companies now chooses to work with only three or four companies. One of them we are blessed to be is us and me. And I was in Pondicherry with him and we actually took all these Excels and all these presentations for a two, three, over two, three days and broke them down and condensed them into these values. Authenticity, be authentic, be responsible, be vulnerable, long term and be in guru mode, right? To think in guru mode and, and not be a doormat or, or lower cost type thinking. And we made these values across three broad uh, themes. A customer, how will I be with my customer? How will I be with my team? Or what is the expectation from a team? And how will be I be with myself? These are questions for, um, you know, values in action for everybody across the company. So, and so we actually broke these down um, into behaviors as well. So we have a detailed Excel file for every uh, cross section of being authentic with a customer team myself. We have values, uh, sorry, defined behaviors. I'm sorry, that's, uh, you know, the conversation is disturbing me a little bit if you don't mind. Yeah, thank you. In this table, second table, please. Thanks. Um, so we actually have defined behaviors, right? Because sometimes all these values can end up becoming just words and you don't relate to them. So how do we make people relate to them is by making them descriptive. And so we actually have a set of, you know, described behaviors, about 30, 40 of them across each of these transactions. In 2013, um, I was uh, lucky to be in a room with Anand Deshpande of Persistent Systems. He's the CEO of Persistent Systems. I'm guessing it's a billion dollar company for no rhyme or reason, right? Just out of a state of being of giving. He was in a small room with entrepreneurs like me, struggling entrepreneurs like me. And during his long presentation over one day, he actually talked about hug your customer. And he had a small little boy hugging this huge white tiger and all of that. And that was a defining moment for me. I, I had a conversation for about 30 minutes or 20 minutes with Anand uh, on what hug your customer really meant. And that became a living philosophy for, for me and for Srijan from then on. And uh, I recently read that there is, again, papers around and a book called Hug Your Customer. So, I mean, was a sort of a validation that we must be doing something right or learning new ideas from outside and adopting and all of that. So we, we have themes in our values. Customer, hug your customer for a team, collective growth like a sangha. And for myself, a belief that I'm continuously work in progress. I'm not like a baked person, right? So I'm continuously, I must improve and at all levels. Doesn't matter if you're the CEO of the company or you're just an entry level developer. You have different types of learning, but you're continuously work in progress. And we want to keep driving that value system in our people. 
So I'm coming back and trying to build this whole story into where I'm going with this. So what these books also taught me that if you can't be all the time, you start by doing. So sometimes you're, you know, you have to take actions to start being, and then having will happen. So having does not have to happen first, absolutely not. So it's, it's be, do, have, if being um, authentic, for example, is difficult, practice some behaviors which demonstrate authenticity and slowly your being will change. And I have an example here. You know, our relationship with money, for example, for a lot of us, or our relationship with our health, for example, is constantly about not having enough. Yeah? How many of you have enough money, all the money that you ever need here? Right? Two hands, three hands, right? That's how all our relationship, mine is, at least used to be as well, okay? And not that I have tons of money anymore, but that started changing. Hmm? And so think of the universe as a photocopying machine, okay? Forget about all these big ideas of God and all of that business. Just throw them in the dustbin. Maybe there is nothing called God. Just throw that whole idea in the dustbin. And think of universe as a conscious, as just simply consciousness, right? Actually, that is the central Indic idea, that the universe is conscious. Now, what if it was a photocopying machine? Whatever are your thoughts, your constant thoughts about yourself or your relationships with money or whatever else, and that starts getting photocopied, okay? So if you do not have enoughness, the universe says, okay, you have constant thoughts about not having enough or wanting more, I'll give you more wanting, right? And what if you were to change your base thought about it, that I have enough, then the, this conscious universe actually starts giving you more and more enoughness, which actually translates in manifested enoughness, right? So it's a wonderful idea, and this actually comes across in the book called Conversations with God very powerfully. For it, at least for me, it came very powerfully. So um, now you can't go around fooling the universe and saying that, yes, I have enough, all of that business, right? your base thought sometimes can't change. So the book suggests uh, something very radical. It says when you take out, when you see a person, an opportunity where you can give, whether money or anything else, just give, don't think, don't bring your mind in that. Just, just give and start practicing giving. By the practice of giving, you will start being giving. The moment you start being giving, you will have enoughness and then enoughness truly starts following. So, like I said, it was a very powerful idea, and I practiced this all the time. This book also taught me, these two books, especially about grace. Uh, actually, the psychiatrists, uh, you know, coming from a very Western civilization, rooted in Christianity, um, psychiatry, science, and talking about grace was a really, um, uh, normally doesn't fit that worldview, right? In India, we call this Kripa uh, in Hinduism. So there's this uh, writer, she says, you can have the words chance, luck, coincidence, serendipity. I'll take grace. I don't know what it exactly is, but I'll take it. So I looked up uh, definitions of grace, right? So imagine this definition, the act of freely providing spiritual blessings to sinners who do not deserve them. How empowering is that? Completely horrible non-Indic idea, right? And there is another idea, which is smoothness and elegance of movement, yeah? which is an ease of smoothness, like a, like a river flowing. It's, it's graceful, like, like animals in a forest. And the, at, when a tiger walks, if, have you ever been on a tiger safari? I mean, just full of damn grace. So how do you become available to grace, or how does grace avail become available to you? You know, and so Sadhguru, I, I'm, I'm a meditator, as I was introduced, I've been, I meditate every day since 2008. Actually, I've been meditating since I was, I don't know, 17, 18 years old, but extremely erratically, and that doesn't help. So it, it comes with discipline, and that discipline changed in 2008. So since then, I meditate every day, in a 365-day year. I probably miss 10 days or something like that, maybe. So if you do the right things, right things happen to you. 
Okay, so what are these really these right things? So basically, I'm coming to the point that you know you have to there has to be work on the inside, on the being, and which which starts with uh, things like meditation. The earlier speaker was talking about you know India being the originator of the human idea or something like that, and I thought he was trying to say the same thing. So work on the inner and the outer world starts to change. Um, if you don't do anything of your own, if you are less of yourself, that is the best way to receive. Right? It's constantly living in our mind, in our logical mind. That is what the modern Western world especially, I'm not deriding Westernism, okay? That is not what I'm saying. But I'm saying take the best of Western ideas, but there is some very serious Indic ideas which we tend to leave aside completely in running our day-to-day -day lives. Maybe in our lives we adopt them in some superficial ways, but certainly not in our businesses. And I think there is, there is an opportunity for us to revisit those and you know, look at some of those values and incorporate them in our businesses as well. So I'll end my presentation with uh, sort of summarizing in some ways that being leads to values which are expressed in doing and behaviors. Values in practice, which is doing, leads to culture constantly. You can't fake culture. Right? It, it's there. You can articulate values later, but the values have to be authentic and available to people in your organizations. And working on the inner um, leads to grace. Grace leads to serendipity uh, incidents which lucky chance incidents which you're not looking for and they happen in your life. And these together is actually what leads to success. That's all my presentation is. I'd be happy to take questions and do any interactions. It is totally non-agile delivery. <laughs> Nothing, yes. Any questions? Uh, anything you want to talk about. And it'll be nice for you to open up, be a little vulnerable, ask a question which which makes you sometimes feel like a fool. It's okay. Yes. Um, I'm using mics? Okay. Thank you. Hi, my name is Vanita, and I'm from uh, Publicis Sapient. Uh, I'm a very spiritual person. So what uh, overall, what I can relate to here since yesterday, that Agile is more or less related to spiritualism. <laughs> I would say completely now. <laughs> no. Good, good so, idea. Yeah. So the way I look at it is that, you know, our basic scriptures, the, uh, the ancient scriptures that we have, like the Bhagavad Gita, or even some spiritual practices like Reiki, or uh, Hinduism, like basic concepts of Hinduism, or many other such uh, spiritual techniques or uh, religions or whatever you want to call it. I feel they teach us almost everything. So the way I look at Agile is that Agile is basically connecting us to our roots. It is taking us back to our roots. That's what I'm taking away from this Yeah, that's session. true. So it's, you know, the whole paradigm of being Agile before doing Agile. All of this is actually that. That's the only story I have here to tell. But being cannot be inauthentic, right? Being cannot be, you know, when I interview people, there are lots of people who come in with wonderful words like servant leadership and all of these big words. And I, you ask them a few questions. You see, you can't live at the surface. You can't live at the surface and use words like that. That's the big problem, right? We pick up these big words and un barely understand them, barely work on the inside and say they are servant leaders. And it takes real big shit to be a servant leader, okay? <laughs> so, yeah. Hi, so one of the values that you had listed for 2020 was be vulnerable. If you could elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, so actually talking about all of these things, talking about Kripa in a business conference, is that being vulnerable? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> right, so, I mean, you have to just do that, right? For if you are honestly, if you're authentic with yourself, there is no other way to live but be vulnerable in groups where you can stand in judgment of by people. That's okay, right? Maybe there are groups and organizations, environments you don't fit into. But 
to start living in authentically or with with a different set of values just to fit in that environment, I think is like slow suicide, right? So it's better to live and create environments and people and structure around you which, which actually enhance what your value systems are. Makes sense. That's the purpose of relationships, all of them also, by the way. So vulnerability is about that. But if I, if I could actually open the Excel that we had, um, you know, in project situations, it can be even simple things like um, just saying that, okay, we screwed up. Yeah, we messed up the project. And here it, here it happened because of X, Y, Z reasons. Of course, we started with positive intent. Um, we are where we are. Here are three things we're going to do to fix it. It requires courage, which actually is an agile value system, if you like, in the agile manifesto, if I'm not wrong. Um, it requires just vulnerability of being judged as having screwed up, not in control, right? And it's okay to do that. I remember somebody asking a question called, what will my customer think and all of that. Just, I mean, customers are finally human beings as well. They just, I mean, yes, some of them are idiots. <laughs> but uh, if they are, then, I mean, sooner or later, it's not going to work out anyways. I'm not saying give them up and run them away. See what you can do with working with them. But it's normally because they, everyone is human, they, you, you can engage in a difficult conversation, in a vulnerable conversation all the time. Yes? Uh, so I have worked with few startups and my experience is that uh, startups really struggle when they scale. Uh, so what were your challenges? Because uh, they start with a very close-knit team and then uh, when you scale, you have to you know, hire a lot of people in a very short amount of time. Then your culture goes for a toss. And then all that organization within the teams, it gets really tricky. So I want to ask you, what were your so challenges of scale? I don't know if I have a recipe for that, but it's continuously working on keeping your culture, right? So for yeah. example, last year, we, I gave up my being a CEO. Yeah. I found a CEO. And, the, and I took on the, op, the uh, role of being a chief of operations. Yeah. Actually, in 2018. And uh, the reason I did that was because I was traveling so much for customers. And increasingly, our business was becoming so difficult for, you know, technologically so advanced that it was hard for me to sell. And so whoever was the right person in that job for doing it better than me, right, Asked, invited him to be the CEO of the company because to be in front of customers required that. And also the reason I looked into, took on chief of operations was because I needed to focus on culture. We were expanding very fast yeah. and I could see all the problems coming up. So all I wanted to do was sit here and work with people and keep the sort of hold, get control, be the pivot around culture and value. So somebody will have to do that. I, no other and recipe. it takes a lot of courage. Of course. Okay. Time, patience, working on yourself constantly. Yeah. Right? I mean, you can't ask people to become better unless you, become you demonstrate constantly what are three areas, for example, that you are working on. So I have a daily Excel which I have to report back to my coach every month, every week and every month on five or six areas that I am working on. And I have a group of stakeholders, eight, nine of them in Srijan, who have to go back every 15 days and ask, how am I doing? Now, only when you, this is vulnerability, by the way, only if you practice that, right? Asking people, how am I doing? And they're telling you, here is where you screwed up. Okay, I, I listen to you without responding. I will go back to my coach, for example, and say, okay, here is the two steps I'm going to take and come back and report to you. You could be a senior developer sitting in a retrospective, you could be a senior manager, you could be the CEO, but I'm coming back to you based on, uh, you know, your feedback, your feed forward, and I'm coming back and reporting that here are two things I'm going to do. That spreads. When that spreads, yeah. culture happens. Yes. Thank you. Yes. I, I yes. have one, maybe. Somebody at the back. We still have 15 minutes, so we are good. Yeah. I'll end it before time. Uh, just a question out of curiosity. Uh, as you mentioned, you have fixed salaries, uh, you know, for, for 
different designations. So let's say there are 100 managers and all of them are on a fixed salary. How do you differentiate a manager, you know, working in great spirits versus someone who is not so great? Seniority. Seniority and different salary brands for those seniority. So it's not that one, ma if there's only one level for every manager, right? So you promote at the end of the day. Of uh, but in the same band, if there are, you know, a couple of people yeah, who... Then they remain at, at that. If there are a couple of people who have some variance between them, right, and if they're not ready to move to the next level, they will remain at pretty much the same salaries, right? So that's sort of the structure. I mean, it will take me another session to discuss that. Mm. And I don't know whether this is the right thing or the wrong thing, to be honest. It's working for us, yeah? And we struggled with a lot, other, lot of other things, but everything had a problem. So we came up with this. It seems to be working for us, and we're not fixated on this. If it requires change in another one year, we'll change it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you come across scenarios where you, know, you feel the person is not there yet to get promoted, however, he's doing much better than others? Much better than others at the same band. At the same that. time? Yeah. Still, they would be on the same. If they level. are, and when, as soon as we feel that this person's ready, and in a in a comparison, if you like, among four or five people, this person is consistently performing better than the rest of them. They move up, right? That person moves up to the next role, next L level. We have L one, L two, L three, L four, and so on and so forth. We couldn't even come up with creative names than L one and L four. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Um, Rahul, uh, great thoughts that you have shared. Thank you. Um, uh, just uh, you talked about vulnerability a lot, um, and one of the things that you are trying to do. Uh, but typically, being vulnerable means you have to be positive all the time. You have to let go of your negative thoughts, mm -hmm. on because obviously there are negative thoughts that keep pulling us back, that Actually prevent not. us from being, being vulnerable, vulnerable. Is also about saying that I'm feeling weak. Is also about saying I don't know. So it's a sense of weakness, actually. Yes. Yeah, so uh, typically, people, uh, the, in, the inherent, uh, inherent uh, human behavior and human psychology is about not showing that we are weak, mm -hmm. right? And then, how do you, how do you overcome that? What are the tips that you have to, for us, <laughs> for any of us, maybe we can take back. Okay. Firstly, I don't know if it's inherent human behavior. I think it's inherent human behavior to actually just be normal and say, I'm, I'm scared. I don't know how to handle this, right? But we are constantly bombarded with these ideas that you have to be in control, you have to win, and all of this nonsense, right? Put your goal, your big vision board, and just go after it, just do it. All this nonsense we are taught. Right? It's not that it comes inherently to us. I think it inherently comes to us for vulnerability comes inherently to us, you know. So, with my son, I have a 13-year-old son. Since he was very small, we had this music playlist on my iPhone which says that um, music when Papa is down, right? When I'm feeling down, here is music to pep me up. And it's okay for me to tell him I'm feeling, I'm not feeling good. I'm feeling very down and low, you know. But what does the world tell us? No, no, you can't be like that with your children. You have to constantly stay. All this nonsense is not necessary. He is a much better human being because I am just a normal adult with him, normal person who has his ups and downs. That's okay. Good question, right? It, yeah. So, the business world requires a certain level of whatever. But if you have certain intimacy, you know, you can share that. You know, you can share at least I don't know or I'm, I'm, I don't know how to handle this or things like that. A problem at you have a better idea on how to handle this. Showing your weakness is okay. People get it anyways. You know, constantly putting the facade of strength and all of that leads to I don't know. It doesn't lead to empowering results. Yeah. So, you see, people will also start behaving human when they see their leader being human. human. So, then that creates an environment where they can also feel, ki, I don't know, can you help me here? All of these conversations start.
Yes. This reminds uh, of a frequent yeah. statement which we hear, boys don't cry, yeah. men don't cry, right? All nonsense. <laughs> hey, Rahul, uh, uh, I don't have a question, but uh, I mean, it was a beautiful journey through your school of thought. So I just wanted to uh, share out something which I came across uh, a, a couple of years back. It was a, like, uh, you know, uh, there was a uh, Carl Sagan, an astrophysicist. So uh, once he uh, like said that uh, the basic principles, the founding uh, uh, foundation theory of holographic principle is that our lives are acting out of, uh, I mean, uh, it's a 4D projection, a 3D projection out of the farthest end of the cosmos. So basically our lives are just acting out of, uh, out of a painting over the, over the biggest canvas in this universe. So, and that made me think, and which probably you validated here in this session, that if that be true, then what are we struggling for? <laughs> probably the answer is, like you mentioned, uh, grace and craft, that's all. Just be bright and be graceful. Yeah, I mean, see, um, you know, finally, um, I had done a course many, many years ago, I think 99, called Landmark Education, and there they had this uh, thing, this analogy that if you become a really big and famous person, pigeons will come and shit on your head. You know? So they'll make a statue out of you and finally pigeons shit on your head. Right? So it's all meaningless to be honest, right? And that is a great place to operate from. It's a great place to operate from that finally this is all purposelessness. And if you are a believer in indic value systems, then you will keep coming back and keep taking new bodies and keep giving up new bodies, rebirth and all of that. It's an endless journey towards what? Towards growth. The book Roadless Traveled actually talks about this beautifully, right? There is that we are inherently lazy. And the world, you know, we are inherently lazy towards growth. Growth towards what? Towards just becoming conscious. That you know, of consciousness, of oneness of every damn thing in the, that exists, that is manifested. It's a great place to operate from. And finally, when we are here, we just create meaning. So you create meaning. And in that creating of meaning for our own lives, um, I guess things that life knows better for us is a useful place to operate from than constantly operating from, I know exactly what I'm going to make out of my life, right? Yes, we'll, I don't know how much time do we have now. This was really an interesting session. Okay. Yeah, hey Rahul, um, Arpita from Publicis Sapient. So, uh, first of all, it was a great, uh, you know, experience being part of your journey. Uh, totally uh, perceived it well. Uh, one of the intriguing points was about practicing open salary. So, I was really, in, would be interested to know how it really helped you and, you know, uh, achieve some of the anticipation that you might have when you initiated it. And the second question is, uh, was there any kind of, uh, you know, out of the box practices that uh, Srijan did in terms of adding diversity that could help in the transformation? Uh, okay. Uh, I don't know too much about the salary piece. It seems to be working. That's all I really can say that there is no major ruckus, not many people are complaining about it. We were scared when we started this again three years ago, that have structures and all of that. This time we didn't go around sharing Excel. So at this level, this is the salary, right? But the point is that all people talk. You can write as much as you want in the appointment letter that you will not go share your salaries. It's meaningless. So why keep doing meaningless things? You know, yeah. just create structures for transparency. So that's sort of was the, it's, it's, it's working. If, if it requires to be changed, we will be a little intransparent about that. But so far, I don't know. It, does, it works. I, I don't have a magic formula to answer your question. Your second question was around... Um, I, I don't go... I mean, so for example, in gender diversity. I don't go around seeking gender diversity. You just be... You just find good people. It just so turns out that most of our middle management is led by women. We are a very heavy middle management women-led organization, okay? So massive numbers of people finally report to women in our organization, okay? But it's just, you know, just happened. Right? We didn't design it. So I don't know. We don't, you don't go seeking diversity, I guess, so much. It's, it's okay. You just find good people, you work with them. Just an openness is good enough, I guess. 
Yeah, Rahul, first of all, I am very impressed. Uh, it takes a lot of courage to talk about the board steps you are taking. Uh, how has it stood the test of time? So has there ever been a situation where you had to take a tough call, let's say, of losing a client In just cases. because of principles and values? Uh, for our people, for example, absolutely, yes. We actually let go of customers. So in one of our doing behaviors, if a customer is being an asshole, sorry about my language, we will fire the customer. If they're being absolute idiots with our customers, we will not care how much they value, how much business and what profits they can bring us. We will, ask, we will walk out. And, but that does not mean that people are going to become, you know, we're not people first company. We're not that. So we will not put people over our customers. It's a good balance, right? It's a yin and yang. You, our customers pay our salaries, and I remind all our organization, our members, all the time, it's our customers which pay our salary. So you bend backwards, but you cannot become a doormat. You see, operating in India, we have to battle the India outsourcing cheap labor, whatever tag, all the time. I have to do this all the time. And so what happens is that this tendency to make us a doormat happens very often, very frequently in some types of customers. You walk out. You can't work with them. If there is disrespect, you can't work with them. Yeah, an example of people might be easier, but uh, let's say you talk about vulnerability. So would you go into a pitch and say that we just don't have the skill, and uh, but we are ready to try? I would happily say that. Okay. Actually, my sales is all around that. I would happily say we don't know, know this. There have been client calls where we've been called into a management meeting, and I'll give you a real example. We have a Go office. This is 3, 2017, if I'm not wrong. We were just doing Drupal and JavaScript work for this particular person, just some really terrific JavaScript work with high charts and visualizations and all of that. They were so impressed with our work versus a very large SI, and we like one hundred, one thousandth of their revenue or their ability and all of that. They got us on a call and we were like, what have we done wrong that all they're calling all of these big guys into a conversation with us? And they said, that, guys, we are so impressed with your agile practices and the way your people are. You know, we never get to talk to developers, for example. Here, you're the only company who are exposing us and things like that. We're just so impressed that we want you guys to do more. We know you're, you're Drupal and JavaScript and all of that centric. Can you build Python skills? Uh, and, you know, like Richard Branson says, or whatever, that first you say yes, then you figure out how. So the first answer was we looked at, all of us looked at each other and said, yes, okay, but what's your prop proposal? He said, well, we know you're st small as well, but will you scale up with us? He said, okay, what numbers are you talking about? He says, you, can you set up a 50 to 70 people team just doing Python for us? So, you see, we are, we are not a Python company, but we see ourselves as an engineering company. Taking Python or adopting Java, that's not difficult. That's not the problem. And they were willing to go with us knowing very well that we do not have Python skills, that on the call we will say we don't know how to do this. But they just trusted the, the behaviors and the values they were seeing with us over two years. Happens all the time. Okay, I guess we are out of yes. time. Yes. Thank, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Well, Thank you, Rahul, for, uh, for the rich experience that you have shared with us. So great. Can I request Mr. Harshwardhan to come on the stage, please?